So here goes the classic story atop Mount Masada that we need to tell and remind ourselves of just why this place is so unique and special. The views are breathtaking, and the ruins are there to remind us about why this place was built in the first place. Why did our wicked King Herod build this winter palace atop a mountain? Just in case. A little insurance policy. Once in his reign, he had to run away. The wicked king was chased out of Galilee, and he left his lovely wife Miriam and his children on top of Mount Masada to go run to Rome and beg Augustus, please, Caesar, give me an army to put down these rebels and I will serve you loyally. And Herod did just that and became a Roman puppet, a Jewish king from a convert by force. Grandfather, remember, the convert that converts to Judaism by love is praised and we sing the honor of that mission. Whereas one who is forced to convert by sword, just as Herod's grandfather once was, is a painful situation that reminds us never, ever do we force ourselves upon others. And so the wicked King Herod builds a winter palace up top of Mount Masada. And when the time comes, it does not come. Herod never needs to use the palace for another escape because he will die as an old man in his bed, a lucky finish for a cruel dictator tyrant. But alas, a few generations later, that winter palace that was sitting there, stocked and ready just in case, found its use when a bunch of rebels fleeing from Jerusalem in the burning flames of our people and our holy city being thrashed and burned by these evil Romans, the 10th Legion, those cruel warriors. And these survivors come running down and overrun the garrison of Romans on top Mount Masada and live. Just to live is a sense of defiance. To be alive as a Jew sometimes is a statement of rebellion. And these rebels live and they build homes and they tear down the palaces that no longer serve a purpose. And they create little homes for the little families and the little ovens that keep a little bit of bread and a little bit of life alive on top of that mountain for three years. The war is over. Vespasian has won. His son Titus has taken over the battle. Jerusalem burns. The Judean hills are alight with flame and destruction, and our peoplehood is smashed. Less for 300 rebels on top of a mountain. And returning to Rome, these generals hear about these would-be rebels holding out on top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere and say, to the very last man, we shall destroy them. Our enemies try to snuff us out and they send an army 10,000 strong to the middle of the Judean desert around Masada with the wall. Look, look down and look at the siege wall that's still there today. The Roman camps dot the horizon and they come for us building a ramp, rolling stones and bracing with sticks and slaves by the tens of thousands to waste. Imagine standing guard on top of that mountain, looking down at your friends and your family from Jerusalem, the survivors, working with the Romans to build a ramp, to haul up a siege tower, to bring about our destruction. The rebels on top of Masada, day by day, are counting their last breaths as the Roman army comes with a siege warfare that no other army in history has been able to accomplish. And when they get to the gates atop the mountain, having wheeled up the siege tower, the winds are blowing towards the Jews. The flaming arrows do not help us and we cannot defeat our enemies as the fires turn against us and they batter down our barricades and they batter down our siege wall and they come for us. Not yet. One last night to let us sweat and suffer before they break down and break in and bring about our death and destruction and slavery. That last faithful night. Imagine what you would think knowing tomorrow morning the Roman army is coming through that burning broken gate the last of our defenses, and they will come for us. They will come for our wives and children and for our slavery and death. Could you sleep? Could you rest? Could you be able to be still in your heart, knowing that tomorrow fate would come for you with a cruel hand of injustice and horror? And so rather than let that fate befall them, the rebels did the ignoble, honorable, terrible deed, and they kissed their wives and children and took their lives. The last 10 men slaughtered each other and only one man was left to have to commit the mortal sin of suicide. And this tragic, fateful event is what marks Masada in eternity. When the Romans broke through the next morning, they saw supplies and weapons and a would-be siege that could have been prolonged and the bodies, hundreds of bodies. Rather than submit to Roman victory, these people took the last ounce of their freedom in defiance of our tyranny and enemies and took their own lives.
Now, this is a dilemma because suicide is frowned upon in our Jewish faith, but resistance is something that we can rally around. And so we have to settle with the discomfort knowing that these would-be slaves took their lives rather than submit to slavery, while at the same time they took their lives in defiance of tyranny. This is the discomfort and the quiet upon Mount Masada today. That is the final resting place of Jewish souls who stood up in defiance of our enemies and said, I will not submit and I will not go gently into that dark night. We, Israel, we Jews, we Hebrews and Shebrews are a testament to their struggle and resistance and defiance and our toils and turmoil today that we can struggle with gives meaning to what it is to be a Jew. I feel fulfilled having known you and traveled together and us, our mini family for a few days, being able to make a testimony of how wonderful we can be when we rally together and step one foot in front of another, traveling together as Hebrews in our homeland. What a joy. What better way to give honor and homage to the 300 fallen from Mount Masada.